You know, I'd like to tell you Happy Easter, but of course, by the lunar calendar that Jesus went by, Easter was last Sunday, not this Sunday. By the calendar Jesus went by, this would have been the time of the Omer, the time of the Omer, the period of time between Passover and uh, Pentecost, as we looked at in our teaching on the book of Ruth. Uh, it was, of course, during the Omer that, the Jesus, that Jesus made his appearances, such as the first one being on the road to Emmaus. He made his appearances during the Omer. That's what have actually would have been happening this time, not Easter, not Good Friday. Easter came after the Quadridecimian Schism, as we've pointed out many times. We either believe Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and 1 Corinthians, or we believe church tradition and, and the Quadridecimian Schism going by the solar calendar instead of the calendar that Jesus would have went by. Now, again, if you celebrate the resurrection today, I have no problem. We should celebrate the resurrection every day. And if you celebrated Good Friday on Friday, I have no problem. We should all endeavor to pick up our cross and follow Jesus every day. These things are not a problem in themselves. I'm simply stating we need to understand when the scriptures say these things happened and not confuse the traditions of men with what the word of God actually teaches. One man esteems one day, one another. If this is your Easter, I have no problem, but understand that it's not the day of the resurrection, according to the New Testament. Be that as it may, let's go further with this. When I was a little boy, uh, Easter was obscured by the Easter Bunny. It was Jesus out of the picture. I was thinking about the Easter Bunny and the chocolate and the baskets and the Easter eggs and things like this. It was either a Father Christmas, a Santa Claus, uh, eclipsing Jesus at Christmas, or it's the Easter Bunny of all things that was of pagan origin, eclipsing Jesus on the day of the resurrection. All of these things are, of course, of pagan origin again. We want to just look at what's in the scripture, and this week is the week of the Omer. Therefore, our teaching will have nothing to do with Easter because it isn't Easter. Again, I'm not trying to offend your tradition. But I remember as a young believer in New York attending a Baptist church in Manhattan, and that was I had not been saved all that long. And it was a prominent church, and there was a number of prominent preachers who'd been associated with it over the years such as Donald Hubbard and uh, Alan Redpath and Stephen Olford. It was known as the Good Church with Good Teaching, Baptist Church, and I was attending it. And there was a large Sunday service every morning and a large Sunday service every night. However, on Easter, there were two Sunday services because there were people who said they were Christians who said they were saved Christians, who said they were Baptists, who said they were born again, who came to church twice a year, Christmas and Easter. And they come in their nice Easter outfits. In America, Easter becomes a fashion show uh, where you don't have to be a model to show off your haberdashery. It's held on Fifth Avenue in Manhattan. People would parade up and down Fifth Avenue and hope to get on television in the Easter parade. That's what Easter was about, a fashion show, and church was purely cultural. These things really disturb me, and they should disturb you. But what do we expect from a post-Christian society, and what do we expect from a church that's no longer the scriptural church in many respects? What do we expect from Laodicea? What do we expect from nominal Protestantism and so forth? Be that as it may, the real Jesus is here. He was crucified. He is risen, and he is coming again. And by his spirit, he's meeting with us now, and he's speaking to us through his word. I am nothing. I am simply an unworthy vehicle. It's not about me. It's about Jesus, who is the Logos. Turn with me, please. First of all, our subject tonight, the Daughters of Zion. Turn with me, please, to Ephesians chapter 5. I'll begin in verse 22. Wives, be subject to your husbands, as to the Lord. 
For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church. He himself being the savior of the body, but as the church is subject to Christ, wives should be subject to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as also Jesus loved the church and gave himself up for her, so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. Husbands should love their wives as they love their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. We are members of his body. Jesus died for the church. If God forbid you were ever in a situation, and there are some Christians in the situation, and with persecution, there'll be other Christians in the situation. If it's a choice between your life and your wife's, you die. She lives. Because we have to love our wives the way Christ loved the church. That's simple. Wash with the water of the word. The spiritual headship of a house and family is to be the husband and father. In an ideal nuclear relationship, of course. The husband and the father is to be responsible for the spiritual welfare of his family, beginning with his wife by the washing of water with the word. It is a shame and a disgrace, as we've said many times, where we have women who are the spiritual head of the family because the men will not take responsibility for it. This is horrible. Co-equally horrible was the promise keepers who taught unscriptural things about matrimony and about the role of men and husband, things that directly contra contradicted the word of God. Be that as it may, that's not our purpose tonight. We mention it only in passing. Now notice the relationship is between the husband and the wife reflecting the relationship between Christ and the church. We might say in a family that the husband is a pastor, a pastor, an overseer, and the wife is a deaconess, deaconess. She runs the home. She runs the pr practical, physical things of the home, but the spiritual oversight is to be in the hands of the husband. Now, this is a consistent pattern we see throughout Scripture. We'll be looking at a couple of passages tonight, but let's look at another one. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 12. But I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man, but to remain silent. For it was Adam who was first created and then Eve. And it was not Adam who was deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. Okay, now let's continue looking at this even further. The relationship between the husband and the wife. Look with me, please, to 1 Corinthians. Chapter 14, verse 14. I'm sorry, verse, verse uh, yeah, 14. The women are to keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak but are to subject themselves, just as the Torah or the law also says. If they desire to learn anything, let them learn and ask their husbands at home. This is the pattern. Tonight's teaching is based on two earlier teachings. The first is the original version of the Daughters of Zion. We'll only highlight some of it today. I'd refer you back to it. This is built, this is sort of the sequel to the original Daughters of Zion. And the other is our teaching on the spirit of Jezebel. Now notice in each of these cases, in Corinthians, and in Ephesians, and in Timothy, 
there is a danger or a caveat or a warning about the usurping of male headship about the usurping of male headship look with me please to revelation book of revelation chapter 2 verse 19 i know your deeds your love faith service perseverance and that your deeds of late are greater than the first but i have this against you that you tolerate the woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess and teaches and leads my bondservants astray so they commit acts of immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. Notice spiritual seduction personified by the woman Jezebel. Spiritual seduction personified by the woman Jezebel. What you see is this. When in a relationship, in a marriage, in a family, or in a church, where the natural position of the man is usurped by a female, by a wife, by a woman, what is really happening is the place of Christ is being usurped by either a harlot church or a backslidden church. The church is the bride of Christ. It is to be under his headship. This is reflected in holy matrimony and in the family. When Satan attacks the church through things we see happening today, with everything from the ordination of women pastors to so-called Christian feminism, again, the Jezebel spirit running, running wild among evangelicals, when we see this happening, understand, it is not just an attack on the marriage, the family, or even the church. It's an attack on Christ. It's an attack on his family. It's an attack on his marriage. The woman not wanting to be under the headship of the male is a reflection of the church not wanting to be under the headship of Christ. The Old Testament references to this are many, one of which is, woe to the crown of the proud drunkards of Ephraim. They, they, they want to take over. This is absolutely wrong. The church must be under the headship of Christ. When the church is under the headship of Christ, it will be in God's order. The leadership of the church will be responsible and caring men. Husbands will be responsible and caring fathers. The women will be what God has called them to be. In Israel, it was the daughters of Zion. But this is extended to the body of Christ at large. Let's begin. Go with me, please. Once again, back to Corinthians, I'm sorry, to Ephesians chapter 5. Look with me, please, to verse 4, verse 4. And there must be no filthiness and silly talk or coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather the giving of thanks. With your kind consent, I just want to read this verse in the Greek text, if I may. I'm terrible with getting computers to be where I need them to be when I want them to be somewhere. Well, look, please, at verse 4. Neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather the giving of thanks. Now, let's look at this. Kai escrotes, kai morologia, e anthropilia, te oc. Anaconta, Ella, Malone, Eucharistia, get the word Eucharist, meaning Thanksgiving. And the vileness and the morologia, stupid.
stupid speaking. That's what it means. Related to the word moron. Morologia. Escrotes is vileness. It means filthiness. And the filthiness and the stupid speaking. Or the in, some say, in snuendo of reverting to foolish talk, making a joke that is not proper, but rather the giving of thanks. It becomes a joke. Now that word filthiness, escrotes, is a powerful word in scripture. It's sometimes this, uh, translated as sordid, but it means something that is filthy, not just impure, not just a catharsis. In Hebrew, lo tohor has its Greek equivalent in ekatharsis, where there's a mixture of the pure and a mixture of what is pure and what isn't, so it becomes impure, ekatharsis. This is not something that's stained. This is something that is filthy. It is not something stained. It is something filthy. It could also be understood as being disgusting. That word is a powerful word the way it is used in the Greek classic literature and in the New Testament, escrotes. <clears throat> and the other is morologia, morologia. We are not to revile. It's not right to call people morons. But from the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. It is entirely proper to test someone's teaching and to evaluate what they're saying in light of the word of God. And although we may not be able to revile someone and call them or demean them as a moron, we can say that what they are preaching, what they are teaching, what they are espousing or expounding or espousing is moronic. Morologia. Morologia. Same as logos, the word. Morologia. There is a lot of morologia in the modern church. I cannot call Francis Frangipan in the United States a moron. It would be improper for me to call him a moron. But that man once actually wrote an article, an article, in which he said, beware of true doctrine. That was the name of the article. Beware of true doctrine. Because he said, true doctrine can lead us into spiritual pride. Now the scripture says it is false doctrine, leaven, that puffs up and leads us into pride. Francis Frangipan was teaching his congregation the opposite and wrote it in an article. Actually said beware of true doctrine. It'll lead to pride when the scripture says the diametric opposite. What he said was moronic. It was absolutely moronic. There's no nice way to say it, because that's the way Scripture says it. I've heard many such moronic things. So have you. I remember during the counterfeit revivals out of Toronto and Pensacola and these places. And when it was pointed out by people who were warning, this is wrong, this is not a real revival, when they pointed out that scripturally and historically, every revival began by people weeping and, and repenting. Every revival began by people groveling in their prayers and praying and repenting and asking God to forgive them and pour out his spirit. Every revival, scripturally and historically, has begun with people weeping. There was moron speech. There were people who were saying moronic things from pulpits when they were challenged with this fact. They were saying, oh, but this is the refreshing that comes before the revival. Now, in the book of Acts, it says, repent and believe that the refreshing may come. The weeping must come, so the refreshing will come. No, they put the boots on the opposite feet. They were saying this laughing and giggling and animal imitations and the rest of it, and these out-of-control people on the ground and so forth, that this was the refreshing that we have before the revival. We need to be refreshed before the repentance comes. These were words that may as well have come from morons. Am I saying that those people who said it were morons? No, but they spoke like morons. Those people who taught that spoke like morons. I remember people from the Vineyard Movement of the late John Wimber. And 
when challenged about false prophecy. They actually said, that's what they said. Well, prophets can be part right and part wrong because it says in 1 Corinthians, we prophesy in part. That means we can be a prophet can be part right and part wrong? Deuteronomy 18 says you have to be 100% right in what you say. A prophet may prophesy in part because he only understands a part of the ultimate reality. We see this in the book of Daniel. Some of these things were revealed to him piecemeal. He prophesied in part, then he got more. That's what it means. Now, these people were teaching, actually teaching, you can be part right and part wrong and still be a prophet. And that's how, how they were justifying the Kansas City false prophets, such as the alcoholic homosexual Paul Kane and, uh, and, and Bob Jones and these other ones who, who were promoted by Mike Bickle and were predicting things that didn't happen as Mike Bickle did himself. That was their justification. This was moronic argumentation. What they were saying were things that were moronic. They were speaking like morons. Well, let's go further. Let's look at Mr. Bickle once again. I remember Mr. Bickle. People were carrying on and doing all kinds of crazy things in this church, the IHOP, whatever it is. And he, he, he said, well, I know a lot of this is in the flesh. I'm sure most of it is. This is what he said. But I don't want to suppress what's of the flesh for fear that I'll suppress what's also of the spirit. <laughs> now, the scripture says, crucify what is of the flesh. Suppress what is of the flesh so what is of the spirit can truly blossom. He says, no, let the carnality and things that are being done in the flesh blossom as well for fear of suppressing the Holy Spirit. No, no, you suppress what's carnal, so what's of the spirit can come into play and into, into its rightful format and, and, and preeminence. This is moronic doctrine. Moronic doctrine. It is false doctrine fit only for morons. That's what it is. Now, again, I'm not reviling. I'm simply saying what the scripture says. It is completely moronic. Moronic. Well, I was looking at this issue of Daughters of Zion, and I came across something else that was moronic yesterday. A woman who had a seemingly powerful testimony, she'd been in porn films and then came to faith, she says, and she is represented as a biblical linguist of some description. Uh, whether she is or whether she is coached by somebody who is, I am not sure, but she seems to be persuasive in her presentation because she appeals to original languages, but I've heard her teach things that were false. She is the aunt to the pulpit of her deceased husband, Gene Scott, who used to come out with the cigar, and he'd have in his church racehorses and women with bikinis and stuff. I'm serious. And he'd say, I'm not saying another word till I get another $10,000, and you'd have to call up and make a donation. This was Gene, Dr. Gene Scott in Los Angeles, and this woman was his wife. Well, Gene Scott is dead, and now his wife is in his place. And I watched a video clip of her yesterday, and she said, in Timothy, where Paul wanted Timothy to maintain silence from the women in the congregation, that meant that in that local church, that there were women who were bullying Timothy. And Paul was telling Timothy, don't be bullied by these women. And her exact words, well, not her exact words, but what she said was, yeah, but this is what she said. She said, Timothy was lacking, quote, unquote, male gonads. He needed to get some and stand up to these women. That's what it means. It does not mean that women should not teach because she's a woman teaching men. <laughs> now, understand there is nothing in the text read in context that supports what she says. It is complete asegesis. She's reading something into the text it doesn't say. Additionally, 
there was no vocative mood. Additionally, the uh, text implies no rebuke of Timothy by Paul. There's no rebuke. She just made it up. It's a moronic argument. But people clapped because she could say something in Greek and write something on a chalkboard in Greek. This is Moro-Logos. We have much Moro-Logos in the church today. People who teach and say stupid things. Things that the Word of God calls moronic. Nowhere is that more true than in the issue of women pastors, female ordination, women teachers, women leaders. What did the scriptures actually read in context say about this? Now again, I refer you to our previous teachings on the daughters of Zion and on the Jezebel spirit. I will recap for those who are new to us very briefly. Because of the fall, men have been rendered insensitive and women have been rendered hypersensitive because of the fall. Therefore, when you see a husband and wife get saved, it's usually the wife who gets saved first. Not always, but usually. Yet there are many godly women with unsaved husbands, and they go through decades of their lives unhappily married to non-believers. This is terrible, but it happens. It's easier for women to get saved than men most of the time. Men are insensitive. On the other hand, it goes beyond that. When a Christian couple prays for guidance for, for the Lord's direction in a situation, it's usually the wife who hears from the Lord first and clearest. Usually. Because women are more sensitive. The wife is a helpmate to the husband. A wife who is a praying woman, not a nagging one, but a praying woman, should be a Christian man's first and foremost counselor, advisor. You should listen carefully to the voice of a praying wife, not a nagging one. That turns men right off and women are out of order when they do it. But a praying one. Men are insensitive because of the fall. Men are reliant on female sensitivity in a marriage and generally, but let's move on. Anything, of course, God intends for good, the world, the devil, Satan will use for evil. While women are more sensitive than men, they are hypersensitive. Yes, it is easier for women to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit than men. But it's also easier for women to hear the voice of a counterfeit spirit and to confuse emotion with spirituality and be deceived and misled. Women are much more vulnerable to spiritual seduction than men. Leadership is male because it's protective. The way I've described it many times, it's two antennas. The male antenna is too short. It doesn't pick up the signal right away. But when it gets the signal, it's a strong one and it's the right one, usually. If things are in God's order. The male antenna, because of the fall, is too short. The female antenna is too long. It picks up all kinds of signals sometimes contradictory signals, and then the female mind can try to reconcile the two and make sense of them. And emotion becomes intermixed with spirituality. Male antenna too short, female antenna too long. In ministry, in the church, in a Christian marriage, family, Men are reliant on female sensitivity. Women are reliant on male protection. My apologies to those who've heard me say this before. 
That is the basis. It goes back to the fall of man. We're messed up. But let's go look at this subject even further. The daughters of Zion. Look with me, please, to 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 12. A woman must quietly receive instruction with entire submissiveness. I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man, but to remain quiet. It was Adam who was first created, then Eve, and it was not Adam who was deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. Again, Women are more vulnerable to spiritual seduction than men. But this is a picture of the church. When the church is not under the headship of Christ, it is inevitably more predisposed, more prone to spiritual seduction. But now let's look at the context. This woman, Melissa Scott, completely distorted it. But then she went on to say, we know it doesn't mean what it seems to say. <laughs> she goes into reductio ad absurdum argumentation by claiming it's not what other passages or it's not what Paul writes elsewhere in other epistles. Well, it certainly is what Paul writes elsewhere and teaches in other epistles. She's either lying or she's engaging in morologos. She's speaking like a moron. And the people listening to her, especially the men who clap for her, are behaving like morons. And we're not to do that. Now, when it happens, that is a scrotia. It is something disgusting, not just a mixture. It is something vile and disgusting. But let's look at this. I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man to remain silent. Paul elsewhere says, let the older women teach the younger ones. He doesn't say women can't teach. He says women cannot teach doctrine to men. That's what he says. That's what he says. Women cannot exercise spiritual authority over men. That's what he says. It is not saying that women cannot have the gift of teaching. It is to say that when a woman has the gift of teaching, it is oriented towards women. Or children, obviously. That's what it is. No, it is not a prohibition against women teaching. It is a prohibition against women teaching doctrine to mixed congregations, and to men. Now, I accept the fact that those countries I've been to with this persecution and the men were all in jail and there was only women left. The only men there were young believers or something like this. There was no one to do it. Those are exceptional circumstances. But even there, even there, those women would gladly relinquish their position to their husbands or their fathers when they got out of jail immediately. And most of the men were locked up anyway, so they were primarily teaching to women or to newly saved people. But let's continue. When it gets out of this order, it's disgusting. God finds it disgusting. When a woman stands up and does what Beth Moore does or what Joyce Meyer does, God says, that is disgusting. It's disgusting. Not because of the church alone or because of the marriage or the family. That represents the church trying to usurp the place, the covering, and the authority of Christ. 
the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. I didn't always agree with Derek Prince. I, I knew him, but not well, but I did know him. And I didn't always agree with him on certain points, but I usually agreed with him. And one of the things he said once was that feminism is simply the modern female version of secular humanism. Well, he was exactly right. Derek Prince on that point was right. I might have differed with him on deliverance and curses and things like that, but on that point, he was totally correct. It's disgusting. Christ looks upon it with disgust. His disgust is not just for the Beth Moors or the Joyce Myers or the, or the Deborah Menlaws. His disgust is for the men letting it happen. His anger is not just at the Jezebels, but at the Ahabs. It is wrong. But let's go further and understand this. This is a vital issue. Well, I'm going to look at three main arguments that are being made in favor of women pastors women leaders, three prominent ones. But let me go back and just reiterate a little bit on things that we've said in the past. When God uses a woman, her head is covered. That is the real meaning of head covering. It is not necessarily a veil or a hat in the exegetical context and in the cultural context. It was long hair. It meant a woman was under authority of her husband spiritually as a reflection of the church being under the authority of Christ. Now, whenever you see in Esther, there will be a Mordechai. Whenever you see a Priscilla, who's with her? Her husband, Akilah. Whenever you see God using a Deborah, there is a Barak in both Testaments. God does not circumvent his order of spiritual authority and headship because it would mean that the church is acting outside of the headship of Christ. No, when God uses a woman, there's a man there. I do conferences with certain women. Uh, Sarah Leslie is one of them, uh, but I've done, done them with others. These women, or my wife, when I speak with my wife occasionally, my wife is a math teacher, but she has a degree in biblical Hebrew and her he biblical Hebrew knowledge of Aramaic is quite good. When she teaches women, she teaches women's Bible studies with my approval, with her head covered. But if she speaks at a meeting to men, all she's doing, all she's doing is a linguistic explanation of the text. She's not trying to convey doctrine to men. I wouldn't allow that. She wouldn't want to do it. She is dispensing information of a technical nature. She is essentially a translator and a very good one. What she teaches women is different. Sarah, Sarah is a researcher, a researcher. Her head is covered by her husband, my friend Lynn, known them for years. Sarah does research and she dispenses, she disseminates information about contemporary issues facing the church in the area. She is simply a researcher. She's not trying to be a Bible expositor and her head is covered. There are no problems with these things. As long as the woman's head is covered, She's not teaching doctrine to men or to mixed congregations, and she is not usurping leadership in the marriage, the family, or the church. 
that she is not usurping the position that God accorded to men. It's not a problem. Not teaching doctrine. Women can give testimonies, prophecies, or they can dispense information. They can be translators. They just can't expound doctrine to men. And they cannot be the pastors of churches. But there's a scope, plenty of scope for women in ministry. Plenty of scope. Let's go even further with this. Let's look at this issue now. Look with me, please, if you will, to 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 12, once again. A woman must remain quiet, receive instruction, and entire submission. Uh, he relates this to the fall. Okay. But there are those commentators who say that it is specific or especially for married women. It is especially for married women in a marital relationship. If a single Christian woman does not have a Christian husband, an older biological brother, or a pastor, women must be under male headship. Otherwise, it's like saying the church is not under the headship of Christ. And I've seen this Jezebel spirit running all over the place, even among believers, and so have you. It's happening all the time. One of the reasons Donald Trump got into trouble politically, I believe, was he had a out of order woman who was into doctrinal error as his or one of his spiritual advisors. He had listening to Beth Moore. That's one of the reasons that the Lord was unable to allow him to regain the presidency this time. She was an agent of Satan who got in there to disrupt that administration that God was using to stand up for the rights of Christians and to bless Israel and to oppose abortion. Satan had to get in somehow. Find me somebody with the Jezebel spirit. When Christ looked at that situation, he said, this is disgusting. What that woman does is disgusting. Say it the Lord. Well, let's go now again to 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 14. Sorry, I keep saying this. First Corinthians chapter 14, verse 34. The women are to keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but are subject themselves, to subject themselves, just as the Torah teaches. If they desire to learn anything, let them ask their own husbands at home, for it's improper for a woman to speak in church. This is obviously focused on married women. A married woman should not go to the elders or the pastor about an issue, about a question, about a doctrine, about a concern, about an anything, until she first goes to her Christian husband. Now, if she doesn't have a Christian husband, he's an unbeliever, that's something different. But once you are under that headship, the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church. Women do not have the option to do that because they are vulnerable to seduction. It's out of God's order. They go to their husbands. 
and then either their husband raises the issue on their behalf or he at least consents for her to do it but women do not act outside of god's order they just don't do it when you see it happening it's a scrotia in the eyes of christ it is something disgusting there are those particularly in the closed brethren the darbyists the people who invented or whose founders invented modern pre-tribulationism, the followers of John Nelson Darby, a man who Charles Spurgeon and George Mueller warned about. And their followers are rigid that they don't let women speak in church. And this is a text they appeal to. Well, let's look at 1 Corinthians, I'm sorry, once more, chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2. Now I praise you because you remember in everything and hold firmly to the tradition as I did. But I want you to understand that Christ is the head of every man and the man is the head of the woman and God is the head of Christ. Every man who has something on his head while praying disgraces his head. But every woman who has her head uncovered while praying or prophesying disgraces her head. For she is the one and the same as the woman whose head is shaved. In other words, her glory is gone. Her glory is gone. Head being the, head being the glory of the woman in Corinthians. It's dishonorable. In other words, no matter how well made up she is, or cosmetics, or makeup, or whatever, or, or fashion, she's unattractive. Spiritually, she's an unattractive woman. Now, what else do we read about this? Well, does this mean that women have no right to speak or share anything. Turn with me, please, to where Paul uh, deals with this issue once more in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Verse 5, every woman who has her head uncovered while praying or prophesying disgraces her head. Notice, it's not saying women have to be silent. Women can verbally pray in meetings with his men present. Women can even prophesy, exercise gifts of the spirit in meetings. What these extreme Plymouth Brethren groups teach is wrong. By the way, not all brethren are that extreme. There was a schism in the brethren. But the Darbius, they are suppressing women. More than that, they're suppressing the Holy Spirit. Now, the women should do it under the covering of the Lord exercised through their husbands and the male leadership of the church. That is true. But to say that women can't speak in a meeting or pray in a meeting or exercise charismatic gifts in a meeting, that's absurd. What the Darbyists do what the Plymouth Brethren and certain other groups do is they take one passage from an epistle and they isolate it from the rest of the epistle. In other words, they take a text out of context and make it a pretext and they ignore the co-text. Let us continue looking at this even further. Look with me now to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. We'll begin here, please, in verse 3. I'm afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, 
your minds will be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. For if someone comes and preaches another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or receive a different spirit, which you have not received, or a different gospel, which you have not accepted, you bear it beautifully. Notice the character of the church is represented in the nature and character of a Christian woman or of a woman. More vulnerable to spiritual seduction. When the men are not taking responsibility, the serpent is going to try to deceive the woman every time. That is how man fell. That is repeatedly what happened to Israel and the Jews and the Torah. That is what happens in the church, Paul says. Spiritual seduction. They will even wind up believing a different Jesus or a different gospel. And it's happening. It is happening. Oh, I've seen it. I watched Benny Hinn on TV hold up a Roman Catholic Eucharistic wafer on TBN, and he said, this is Jesus Christ. He was upholding the pagan doctrine of transubstantiation. 90% of the people listening to him were women. Women are much more vulnerable to believe garbage. The serpent beguiles the woman. Now, Jesus again warned about this with the woman Jezebel. She will seduce the church. When women are in leadership and in control, the church is already being seduced, and it is going to go into false doctrine, even a false gospel, and potentially even a false Christ. Let's continue looking at this. No matter what you say, it is the same term as in Ephesians. Paul says it is a scrotia when this happens with a woman. And it's the same term as the filthy talk, the coarse jesting, uh, the vulgarity. Uh, you have people who casually on their websites and in their ministry use four-letter words like the Rose Bros, like... Joshua Rosebro with the approval of his father using the F word and things like this on a Christian website. He has people using the F word and he posted on his blog. It means nothing to, the, to them. It means nothing to them. Because the word of God means nothing to them. And then the same Rosebro has a different gospel. He says, salvation or oh, forgiveness of sins comes by confessing your sins to him, kneeling down and telling him your sins. This guy who allows four-letter vulgarity and who prays in front of a statue of Jesus. This is crazy. This is all craziness. These things are a scrotia. They are utterly disgusting. Vulgarity in the church is called something that is a scrotia. It is disgusting, but that's okay with pirate Christian radio and American Rose, but they don't care about that. It means nothing to them. Well, it's the same term. When women are out of God's order, when the leadership of the church is out of God's order, when a marriage is out of God's order, same term, a scrotia, it is disgusting. Filthy. You could, it, it means like filthy. But let's look at it. Let's go and look at these primary arguments. Turn with me, please, to the first argument people try to make of a more scholarly premise for doing so. Look with me, please, to Romans chapter 16. Verse 7, greet Andronicus and Junius, my kinsmen and my fellow prisoners, 
who are outstanding among the apostles, who are also in Christ before me. So time when Paul's in difficult situation in prison. So you have the name of Andraconis and Junius. The first thing we have to address is the question that nobody can definitively answer. Was Junius a male or a female? There's all kinds of arguments. I'll try not to be too technical. Greek can be interesting to some people, but not very interesting to others. Yet we have to give the priority to the original meaning of the original languages. There are those who have speculated that Junius is the Joanna who is wed to Chusa in Luke chapter 8, 13. It's the same woman. There's no proof, but there are those who believe it. And they say that it was a belief held in the earlier centuries of the church. I only mention that in passing. But we have to understand something about the manuscripts. Magisulis. Magisules are the Greek text only written in capital letters. The original, the most ancient manuscripts are all in capitals. There were no accents. Now later on, much later on, beginning in the 8th century, but really more in the copies of the 12th and, 12th and 13th centuries, there was an accent placed over the Alpha, in the name of Junius. That would seem to mean it was a male. Because of the late date of those manuscripts, where you have an accented magisul text, you don't have a strong argument based on textual criticism. You don't have a strong argument for it being a male, but neither can you prove a female. Well, let's look a little bit more at the grammar. In the Greek grammar, you have to deal with the fact that things are not always as clear as we might like them to be. To begin with, we have the word episemes meaning distinguished, or around distinguished. In the Greek, this is dative, dative. Now, the dative in Greek can be either locative or it can be instrumental. What that means is that Julius and her partner were among the apostles, numbered among the apostles in Romans chapter 16. They were numbered among them. It could mean that in verse 7. Andronicus and Junius are numbered among the apostles. It could mean that. But that is the locative. If it was instrumental, and nobody knows for sure, it could mean that they were prominent among the apostles. In other words, among the apostles, they were well known. It is very difficult to determine which is right in the dative. Is it locative or is it instrumental? Does it mean they were among the apostles being apostles? Or does it mean that they were prominent, known among them? You can't be conclusive. Some versions translate it as him being male, others as her being female. The King James follows Erasmus Textus Receptus, says it's a female. Putting the standard version NASB would have it in the masculine. 
It is very difficult to be dogmatic. In fact, you can't be dogmatic. The second concern is this, the declension of the noun. With a noun declension in Greek, it could be male or female, more often female than now, feminine than masculine, more often. But you've got Greek names like Andreas, where it's masculine. Everybody knows Andre or Andreas is masculine. So with Junius. Again, from the dative and from the declension of the noun, it's impossible to be dogmatic. Well, we go to history. The history itself is not uncomplicated because there are no pre-Nicene sources, no patristic sources before the time of Constantine that tell us. It's only later patristic traditions of the church fathers after the time of Constantine, which was a time when the church really began to go off and go away from its apostolic origins and its Hebraic origins. Not that I'm a big advocate of the Hebrew Roots Movement, but I am an advocate of the fact that first century Christianity was Judeo-Christian. And we have to understand it as that to understand it properly. Well, let's continue looking at this. The earliest source we have was just around the time of Nicaea, or just after. Epiphanius, who was the leader of the church in Cyprus, he said Junius was a male who went on to become a bishop or an episcopal, not bishop in the sense we have now, but an overseer, a senior pastor in Syria. But shortly after him comes John Chrysostom. John Chrysostom is one of the architects of what we would today call Christian anti-Semitism. Some of the things he said are very disturbing and were influential upon later generations and had an indirect impact on Hitler's anti-Semitic view of Christianity. That the Jews were for the slaughter and things of this nature, and he opposed Jewish believers keeping their customs and traditions and holy days, even though himself opposed female overseers. Then came Oregon. Oregon said that it was male, but Oregon saying Junius is male doesn't carry a lot of credibility. He was at a later time in Alexandria, and he was influenced heavily by Gnosticism and went into all kinds of crazy doctrines, including auto-emasculation and ultimate reconciliation, that Satan will be saved. He was influenced by someone called Clement of Alexandria, but he came under a strong Gnostic delusion, even though he's historically important for something called the Hexalpa, but I won't go there now. But he said in the Hexalpa that Junius was a uh, male. So there's no consensus. You can't make a good argument. No good argument to be made. How do we understand it? How do we reconcile this important issue? Was there a female apostle? Now, of the 12 and of the 70, 
there were no women. If women could be apostles, you think of the 12 and the 70, some of them would have been women. But there were none. There is no supporting internal evidence. If Junius was indeed a woman, of her being an apostle in the sense of someone who establishes and plants churches and so forth. More about that in a moment. Well, let's look at this again. So, the grammatical arguments, vocabulary arguments, and they've looked at this as a Latin transliteration, things that I could bore you with for an hour and a half. Patristic evidence, none of these things settle the question. But what we can know is that they were in some kind of partnership. We can't be sure they were married or not. Now, I support it being locative, which would be female. I cannot be dogmatic. But concerning the grammar, the dative is locative. I'm pretty convinced. Could be wrong. But I'm not basing my doctrine on that alone. I can't. What I can say is, of the 12 and the 70, there were no women. And there was no other mention of her in Scripture unless she was Joanna in Luke's Gospel, which is, again, speculative. Well, where do we go from here? Turn with me, please, to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Paul is warning about party spirit. And he says this in verse 12. This I mean each one of you saying, I am of Paul, I am of Apollos, I am of Cephas. Notice we have the three major categories of apostles. The three major categories of apostles are there. This, of course, does not account for the Lord Jesus himself, who was called the apostle in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 1. All apostolic authority, of course, comes from him. He is the apostle. The first category of apostle that we see listed here is, I am of Paul. Second, I am Apollos. And third, I am Cephas. Let's work with Cephas first. Cephas is, of course, Peter. Kaifa from the Aramaic, Latinized Aramaic. He's one of the twelve. One of the twelve. The twelve were people who, among other things, had to be with Jesus those three and a half years and had to uh, been around from the time of the baptism of John. So when a replacement for Judas was sought in the book of Acts and they chose Matthias instead of Judas, it had to be somebody around from the time of John the Baptist, Johann Matthias. Even Paul would not have qualified to be among the twelve. Some people say they should have waited for Paul to come. <laughs> no. Even if Paul had gotten saved at an earlier date, instead of being a persecutor of the church, he wouldn't have qualified for the position. According to Acts chapter 1. So Cephas, Peter, is there. Then we have Paul. Paul, like Barnabas and so forth, well, these were apostles who saw the Lord and Paul, by special revelation, received his doctrine directly from the Lord as he writes in 1 Corinthians 11, I received from the Lord that which I delivered unto you. This, of course, as we've said, may have occurred when Paul was taken up and, and, and somehow transfigured or raptured in 2 Corinthians, where he refers to it. We don't know. But he received his doctrine directly from the Lord. 
he had his authority directly from the Lord, the same authority as Peter, James, and John, and so forth. And also, he was inspired by the Holy Spirit to write New Testament canon, to author New Testament canon, and he saw the Lord. So, there's a unique case of people like Paul. Some would put those like Barnabas in the same category, also called an apostle. But then we have the Apollos kind. Apollos was not of the twelve, and he was not like Paul. He had to be coached by Priscilla and Aquila. What he said was right, but what he omitted need, needed to be augmented, filled in. Yet, there's Apollos. Put in the same class, what does it mean? The Apollos missionary still exists. An apostle is one who was sent, sent out by a church. He's one who was sent out. Apollos is a church planting missionary. The only category of missionaries today that exist in the sense of the apostles or church planters. They happen in teams. The Spirit said, out, said, sit out for me, Barnabas and Saul, just the same as Jesus sent the apostles out in pairs. They were not monarchical. Monoepiscopacy came later with somebody uh, called Ignatius of Antioch. No, they were sent out in pairs. They were not one-man shows or little autocrats or anything of that nature. They were all under Christ and they were paired. Apostolic authority in the first century was joint, as we see in Acts 15, the first church council. However, let's look at this now. Are there church planting missionaries today? Yes. And in biblical Greek, the word would be apostle. The word would be apostle. The only kind of apostle we have today are church planting missionaries. Okay. Now those are the three kinds of apostles. However, the word means one who was sent out. It is used in the classical Greek literature for a ship ready to leave the port. That's interesting in itself. But look with me, please, to Philippians chapter 2, verse 25. But I thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and my fellow worker and fellow soldier, who is also your messenger and minister to my need. In Greek, that kind of messenger is also called an apostle. We see it additionally in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 23, the brothers who Paul sends to deliver his epistle. In other words, when the apostles would write something, they would send messengers in their name, having their authority to deliver the message. They did not see Jesus. They were not church planting missionaries necessarily. They were not the authors of the New Testament canon, but they were sent out in the authority of the apostles who wrote the canon to deliver the texts, the scrolls to the churches. That's what they did. This leaves us with two possibilities. Assuming Junius was a female, assuming that. We can't prove it, although there is a 
good argument to be made. If she was a female, there are two, two possibilities. The first possibility is that they were the messengers, people who were prominent among the apostles. They delivered the teaching of the apostles to the churches. They came in the name and in the authority of the apostolic authors of the texts. I speak for Paul. I speak for Peter. I speak for John. I was sent out under the commission of the apostles to deliver what the apostles taught. Nobody believes that Junius was one of the twelve. Nobody believes that she was in that special category that Paul was in, and there is no evidence, no evidence, that she was like a polis. No proof, only suggestion in the minds of some people. The two possibilities. One is that she was those messengers who were called apostles simply because they were sent out in the name of the apostles who saw the Lord and who wrote the text to deliver the teachings to the churches. That is the most likely. The second is what is taught, ironically, by the Eastern Orthodox Church, the Byzantian Church, and the Eastern Churches. The Eastern churches say that they were a church-planting missionary couple, to put it into modern terms. Just think now. We might say, oh, our church in Oklahoma, we have two missionaries in Tanzania, Bob and Phyllis Robertson. We refer to them as missionaries. They're a missionary couple, Bob and Phyllis, sent out from our church to work in Tanzania, they learned how to, how, how to speak Swahili and their missionaries over there in the Rift Valley in Tanzania. That was Mount Kilimanjaro or something. All right. In Greek, you could say they are apostles because they are sent out as gospel messengers to plant new churches. That is what the Eastern Orthodox Church teaches about Junius. Either one is good. In fact, the two are not even necessarily mutually exclusive. I don't know if what Epi uh, Phineas said, that, that he became a bishop later on in Syria, will make sense it could be both. Be that as it may, you have no proof it was a woman. And even though there's evidence to say it was, it did not mean apostles like Peter, James, John, Paul, or even Apollos. Among the 12 and the 70, there was no women. And you have better explanations. If they were so prominent, why aren't they named elsewhere? No. That argument, I would have to say, collapses under the weight of evidence. They can't prove anything from the Greek or from church history, from the patristic literature. They can't prove anything. The feminists in the church have tried to say they can, but their arguments are ridiculous. There's a woman, one of these women preachers, her name was Dirks, D-I-R-C-K-X, like as in Xavier. I watched a clip of her. She said, from the Greek, we can show that this was not true, that there could be women. I would love to debate her from the Greek. I would love to debate that woman in front of the camera from the Greek. Again, Moro Logan. It's weird when you have women like her, Turks, 
Mrs. Dirks, and Melissa Scott, trying to use the competence in the Greek language or the original languages to support error. Just because something is in Greek or Hebrew or Aramaic does not mean it's rightly interpreted. It may be rightly translated, but translation and interpretation are two very different things. What something says and what something means have to be examined very carefully. Well, let's look at the second argument these people like to make for women preachers. Look with me, please, if you will, to Galatians, to Galatians, chapter 3. Begin in verse 24. Therefore the Torah, the law, became our tutor to lead us to Christ so that we may be justified by faith. Then it goes on. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free man. There is neither male or female, for you are all one in Christ. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's descendants, as according to promise. Their argument becomes there's neither Jew nor Greek, neither male nor female. Therefore, women can be pastors, leaders, teachers. The first thing they do is take the text out of context. And the second thing they do is ignore the co-texts. They forget about what it says in Timothy and in Corinthians and in Ephesians. They just take that. No co-text. But the text they take is out of context. In the context, it is talking about salvation. Do men have babies? No. No. Men stay men. Women stay women. Leopards do not change the spots. Jews stay Jews in 1 Corinthians 7. Non-Jews, Greeks stay Greeks. It's not talking about biological or cultural identity. The nature of women and the nature of men did not change at the cross. The male antenna remains too short. The female antenna remains too long. We both are trapped in bodies that are subject to the old nature to a degree. The idea that sexual identity is lost at salvation? This plays right into the hands of the modern LGBTQ agenda that is now making inroads into the church. There's neither male nor female. I can do what a male can do. No, you can. Under Mr. Biden, the American military is having to lower physical performance standards so women can pass the same physical performance tests as men to be fit for combat. The lowering the standards. There was a fire department in the United States years ago that was sued because there was a test of physical performance where you had to run up the stairs of five, five stories in a burning building. It was a ceramic 
tiled building that they could set on fire multiple times to simulate a fire. And there was a, a mannequin that weighed 180 pounds on the top, and you had to run up the stairs with the fire hose on your back and let the fire hose unwind as you ran up five flights and pick up the mannequin and get it down in the heat and in the smoke. That was one of the tests you had to pass to be a firefighter. Some feminist organization went to court and sued and forced them to lower the physical performance standards so women could be firefighters, something women have no business doing. This is the world. This is feminism. It's disgusting. That you're going to let people be fired, put women in, in, in a job like that, or put women in combat brigades? It's disgusting. And when you see women in the church becoming pastors and preachers, it is a scrotia. It is disgusting. It is filthy. What Joyce Meyer does is filthy. What Deborah Menlaw does is filthy. What Beth Moore does is filthy. What Cindy Jacobs does is filthy. It is filth. It is disgusting. But that's their argument. Neither male nor female, therefore women can do what men do. They may as well just out now buy into the current pansexual agenda. LGBTQ, whatever it is. <laughs> Most unfortunate. But it's going on. It's certainly going on. Then, of course, they point to things like Deborah, or they point once again to Priscilla. Yeah, God used Deborah, but only when Barak was her covering. God used Esther, but only when Mordecai was her covering. God used Priscilla, but only in league with Aquila. Find me an exception. They can't find you an exception because there aren't any. Rather than place themselves under the authority of the word of God, they usurp it. When the woman usurps the place of the man, it is a backslidden church usurping the place of Christ. It is nothing short of disgusting. That's what it is. That's all it is. Now look, I do not go with these people, these extreme people who don't let women pray and prophesy or practice gifts of the Spirit. Women can teach other women. Women can be deaconesses. And good ones. But if a woman hears from the Lord, she goes to her husband. That's her covering. I don't want to go through my husband. That's the church saying, I don't want to go through Christ. The Father's the head of Christ, as Christ is the head of the church. Now, shame be upon your husband if he doesn't take the responsibility and authority. But you don't circumvent God's headship. It's just not right. It's disgusting. These arguments they make just don't hold up. It doesn't work. I esteem the role of women in the church. I've known some incredible women in the mission field in Africa and elsewhere. Incredible women. But they're in God's order. I've known some wonderful Christian sisters who God has used in church life and ministry. But they're in God's order. Not out of it. 
When God's order is not there, it is a scrotia. It is sordid. It is filthy. It is not disgusting. It's not just impure or a mixture of good and bad. It's something that's disgusting that has to be thrown away. My friend, who I usually did agree with, now with the Lord David Pawson, wrote an excellent book, Leadership is Male. That's a book well worth reading. He's completely right in what he says and what he taught. Leadership is male. Women have a place in ministry. Women have a place in leadership to other women. But when women exercise leadership, it is through their husbands and the male leaders of the church. Because the serpent will beguile the woman. Gentlemen, let us acknowledge that if we are oops, that we are fortunate if we have a godly Christian wife, a woman of prayer. We are foolish if we don't give careful weight to what she says. She is God's vessel in our life to advise us if she's a woman of prayer. If she's scripturally grounded and a woman of prayer, she is God's vehicle in our life. You want to hear from the Lord? At the scripture, the first voice you're going to hear speak is your wife's. Don't downplay her importance in your life. Women teaching other women, women deaconesses, all correct, all beautiful. Women linguists, like my wife, women uh, researchers, all in God's order. All in God's order. I do not demean women. I do not downplay their importance to body life. I do not ignore male dependence upon them for certain things. But they're women. They should be loved, respected, and treated as women. And women should realize they're women. And that they deserve to be loved and respected and treated as women. But if they try to be a man, they are disrespecting themselves. They are disrespecting their husbands. They are disrespecting the body of Christ. And they are disrespecting Christ himself. Be a woman. Be a man. But don't be a scrotia. Speak the word of God in truth. Don't speak morologos. Thank you so much for listening. 